you can have like an evolutionary advantage, kind of like getting this information via these uh, non-local means. And it also reminds me of, of Rupert Sheldrake's work, you know, the, the whole sense of being stared at. I think all of us have had this experience. No, we just mind our business and we have this impression that we're being stared at. You know, and we turn around and lo and behold, someone's looking at us, you know, and uh, it's a it's a very eerie experience. Welcome to What the Fuck Just Happened. I'm your host, Liz Enton. If you listen to the intro, you know my story. If not, here's a brief summary. I'm a science skeptic, and when my dad died, I took a shot in the dark and decided to investigate if there was any possible evidence of an afterlife. I assumed that was as realistic as Santa Claus, but I was desperate. However, I was so blown away by what I discovered that I wrote a book and launched this podcast. In this podcast, I will be talking to some fairly normal people about some really weird shit. I speak with everyone from psychic mediums and afterlife researchers to ordinary people who've had some inexplicable experiences. So come, listen, there's no need to draw any final conclusions. Keep an open mind and wonder, what the fuck just happened? Hey guys, I'm so excited. I'm speaking today with Christina Morado of Worthful Woman. And we found each other on Instagram because we are fellow skeptics who have found all this afterlife evidence and it has completely changed our lives and she seems as obsessed with all of it as I am. So she can introduce herself and explain a lot better than I can. So go ahead. Liz, it's so great. It's so great to be here and to have finally connected as close as we can get to to one-on-one, you know, maybe one day as well in person. And um, yeah, let me just share a little bit um, about myself work-wise. So I'm a science communicator focused on the intersection of science and spirituality. Um, And I actually pivoted my business to to focus on this not so long ago. So I, I think it was like about half a year ago at this point. I used to do very different work as my day job. But I realized that, you know, while I was job coaching, you know, during the day, let's say, I realized I was spending a lot of time kind of diving into all this evidence around, you know, all this research around what is consciousness, you know, like, uh, which quickly went into discovering parapsychology and taking an introductory course on that, you know, which which opened up all these other branches, you know, which eventually left to to afterlife research as well that that I'm starting to, to, to dig in more at this stage. And it's just also fascinating. And I find there's a lot of topics that keep coming around and connecting and yeah we're gonna go deeper into that later on but i'll just leave it at that for now because i feel like i could talk on for hours by myself oh and anyone listening to this probably realizes we're like twins i mean everything you've just said is so similar to me except i'm never was an official scientist but so i have a lot of questions based on what you just said first of all what was the, what type of science what was your degree and specialty for science yeah sure so um uh, I got my bachelor's degree in uh, psychology so it's like uh, with a focus of research so I have a, a bachelor of honors in psychology which was followed by a master's in educational studies because at the time I was quite interested in educational policy now that didn't happen so far but you know apparently I still managed to make my way into education So that's kind of the background that I have. And I went on to do things uh, more or less related to that. So, you know, I did user research, which, you know, it's it's, it's popular with psychology grads, after which I ended up doing job coaching because at the time I had relocated uh, to to Switzerland. I'm originally Romanian, you know, moved around, but at one point relocated to to Switzerland with my partner because he was working there. And... I encountered all these beautiful people, most of them women, who encountered this job market that, you know, was really tough. They Most of them didn't speak the local language. So I kind of got into that niche. And as I was doing that, you know, 
at one point, I came across this book by Mark Gober, which is called An End to Upside Down Thinking. And this was a, an interesting pivotal moment for me because I was always interested in the spiritual side of life. But let's just say I, I, I had kind of put it to the side uh, once I started my scientific training because I re at the time they didn't feel super compatible, right? So I was raised, you know, with in an Orthodox Christian family, though now I wouldn't identify as, as Christian anymore. I, I don't I don't identify as atheist either. I'm like, I, let's say my beliefs are developing. Uh, probably the closest label I can put on that is spiritual, but not religious. A, 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 a millennial classic, probably, if I, if I look over the statistics for that. And um, yeah, and as I said, like I found, I found Mark's, Mark Gober's book at a point at which, you know, my... My interest in these topics that you may label as spiritual, let's say, was resurfacing, but I couldn't quite integrate it into the way, you know, I, I was looking at life and I was trying to look at life, you know, very systematic, very analytical, that kind of thing. And I kind of discovered this world that, hey, there's very legitimate research being done on topics such as the afterlife, you know, or things that seem paranormal, uh, telepathy, precognition, you know, what have you. And that was really interesting to me. And, you know, it was that little event that kind of snowballed into me, you know, ended up discovering things like the Institute of Noetic Sciences, you know, attending some of the events, being like, oh, wait, there's more people interested in this, you know, and kind of like finding all that research. And yeah, I mean, yeah, at one point I ended up spending so much time on it. I was like, you know what? I, I got the training. I love this work. I don't want to do anything else right now. And I'm just going to be a science communicator. I think this is really needed. I loved Mark Over's book too. I read it, but it was one of the later ones I found. I have even more questions. So none of this was spurred by a loss. It was just an interest and a curiosity, which I mean, in my opinion, when I hear something like that from someone scientific, that gives it even more credibility because it's not coming from a place of desperation. And, you know, mine, I, in the beginning, I was worried. I was like, I'm coming from such a place of desperation. Am I thinking clearly? But you know, just so everyone listening, there's people who are coming at this com in a completely neutral mindset and state too. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess it can never be completely neutral because death affects us all. But am, am I correct about that? There hadn't been a significant loss that spurred this? No. So in my case, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a loss. It was rather... Uh, an attraction to spirituality that had always been there. Now, of course, you could make the argument that it might have been because of my upbringing, because growing up, you know, I had these religious influences around um, and I, I had questions that I didn't feel like got satisfactory answers to, you know, such as, well, we have priests. Why can't women be priests, you know, in, in you know, in the, these churches that, you know, I'm I'm, I'm supposed to be attending and, you know, I wasn't all too satisfied, let's say, with <laughs> with some of the answers that were provided. But at the same time, you know, my, my family's home was also full of books of like, you know, new age spirituality, that kind of thing. So, you know, I got I got exposed to different ways of looking at the world that fall outside of, the, let's say, very scientific, analytical, conventional type of thinking. And I always had that curiosity. But as I said, at one point in life, you know, I also, I, I got into science, scientific training and practice, and it, they didn't feel compatible anymore, but something was still calling me there. And I actually, since I started doing this work as a science communicator, I discovered more and more people who feel the same way. They're like, how do I reconcile these two parts of myself? Can they be reconciled? And I think it's interesting you came from religion and went to science. I mean, to me, what I have been researching and this afterlife evidence has nothing to do with religion. And a very interesting thing, I know Lloyd Arbach says this a bit, it's both religion and intense atheism are a type of like dedicated belief. Like they're based on belief. They're not based on evidence. Whereas mm -hmm. all this, you know, Winbridge and it, you know, Society for Scientific Exploration, all this is just following evidence and that's one thing I really like about it. And I do think it's an interesting thing to say how much a certain kind of materialism and religion are both just belief based, which would get mm -hmm. both sides of that very angry. But mm -hmm. oh, oh, there's there's so much to unpack there. I, I love what, what, what you say about, you know, like taking both 
about the dogma at the end of the day that can be present in 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 both religious systems but also in science you know if we're not careful and just i think at the end of the day it comes down to you know nothing is above questioning we need to question right and i feel oh man yeah i think there's there's multiple ways of looking at this one of the things that i discovered is that when I started delving into all this evidence uh, and research, into all the research around, you know, what consciousness is, you know, when is consciousness this thing that the brain generates or is it something that's perhaps, that can perhaps at least to a certain extent operate independently of the brain, you know, which, which goes counter against how we usually believe about the relationship between brain and consciousness, right? Because the, the materialist way of looking at it is brain generates consciousness somehow. And then you have the hard problem of consciousness, right? How? We don't know, you know? And then going back actually to, to Mark Goldberg's book, what I liked is that he pointed out, well, maybe we're asking the wrong question in the first place, right? So then if you start looking at this relationship between brain and consciousness in different ways, you you end up with, with some, some, some very interesting avenues, right? The, you know, there's this idea of, well, maybe it goes the other way around. Right. Like maybe consciousness is a more fundamental feature of our reality. And then the brain sort of captures, filters that. But it goes it could go the exact opposite way or they're correlated in some way. It's not just just with the causality. And what's what really stood out to me in starting to think about consciousness in that way is that it started to be really reminiscent of religious and spiritual traditions. Right. Because you often hear this, this idea of, well, we're, we're all interconnected, right? The oneness, the interconnection, the God encompassing everything, you know, like the different flavors of that. And then, you know, you, you, you go to an event like, I don't know, like, a, like an IONS event, and they talk about interconnection and how the evidence points towards that. And it's like, oh, it's interesting. There's these parallels. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is that I love science and I believe it's a wonderful way of gathering knowledge. And I think we should be very careful not to slip into dogma and sharpening this beautiful tool all the time. And I also believe there are multiple ways of gathering knowledge beyond the scientific lens as well. And perhaps we're just starting to, to understand that and to also understand how we might access certain types of knowledge through, let's say, radical introspection, that kind of thing. And we're starting to get a scientific understanding on that as well. But that doesn't mean it hasn't happened throughout history. You're right. And so you found Mark Gober's book. That was the very first book you found. Were you specifically looking for something related to survival of consciousness or spirituality or psi? How did you even find his book? Yeah. Oh boy. Like that. You know, I was I was thinking about that, and I do not clearly remember. So I think what ended up happening is that at one point I started getting curious again. I started get, getting curious again about psychic phenomena, psychic claimants, that kind of thing. So I just started looking up these terms online, and I think you know, going from website to website, I think. Ah, if I recall correctly, what happened? I stumbled upon the website of a psychic, and I might have found Mark Gober's book referenced there. So. It was curiosity. And you'd grown up thinking, being taught there was a God and exposed to spirituality. So it wasn't completely out of the realm of impossibility for you when you found his book. It was, you were interested in science or working with science, but it was something you'd been exposed to. It wasn't something that you'd been raised the way I was, that all this is absurd. Oh, no, I, Yeah. For sure. I think we had very different uh, starting points there because, yes, I was definitely more more f familiar and, well, initially, you know, accepted, you know, this idea of, OK, there is a God. Of course, along the way, Liz, I, you know, I've been through every single like type of belief change you can. You know, I, I do not discard the possibility that I might change my mind yet again. But I've been there. I've been there like Christian, agnostic, atheist, agnostic again, you know, like, but, you know. This is, but I think this is the scientific way to go about it. You know, you gather evidence, you draw new conclusions, you update your beliefs if and when necessary. I agree. I think I used to always think, I always said I was Jewish because I'm Jewish culturally, but I was always atheist, but not in the sense of atheists I meet who are really dedicated to it because I grew up in such a secular culture that 
God was just a non-issue. I don't ever remember even discussing God with anyone until I went to college in Austin, Texas in the South. And then I met people from different cultures. And to me, it was just like, it just never even crossed my mind to say to people, oh, I don't believe in God because it felt very like, it just wasn't important enough to me. And at that point, it felt mean to me. Like this was something important to them. Why would I want to like take it away? Like, cool, whatever. That's what they believed. And I hadn't, at that point, seen some of the negative stuff religion has done, which is like, you know, at least in America, which, you know, we don't really have to go into it, but it's passed laws that have taken away people's rights. Like I was so unexposed to religion that it was just considered this naive thing. It just, it was Mm. irrelevant. And afterlife, paranormal, it was all just kind of considered, that was considered just weird. So it was huge life change for me when I found this, like the most drastic So I'm curious what, and I guess, I guess my point was also that I've changed from, I guess, saying atheist to saying I'm an evidentialist. I still personally have not seen evidence of God, but I do think there's evidence we survive. Mm. And, you know, I mean, I think there's evidence that the laws of our universe are very different than we thought. And I think there's evidence that there could be higher levels of consciousness nothing that i would define as anything called god yeah i guess that's what it means being an evidentialist like whatever evidence i see i interpret and that makes me form what i would say is the best possible conclusion and so i guess you said you had all different beliefs what was your mindset when you first found mark's book and took your first steps at that point where were you at oh i think all right, let me let me let me go back because that was somewhere in 2018, 2019. I don't recall when exactly I found his book, but I think I was I was starting to go towards agnostic. So I think I had this like a period in which I was like, okay, there's no God, you know. Then I started kind of opening myself up to the idea again, I believe. And I think that's how that's when I found Mark's book. And you know, I think it's interesting what you said that, you know, you believe that there might be higher states of consciousness, but you're not in a God. And at the end of the day, these words, God, even consciousness, they're labels. Oh my God. And there's like a million definitions of them and of consciousness. And that's, that's actually a huge challenge for, for the scientific research, because we claim to investigate consciousness, but we don't, we don't have a solid grip on what we actually mean by consciousness, or we can't even always agree on that. Right. Or, you know, like it's, it's, it's very hard. I think to coordinate efforts if we don't have clear agreement on what are these terms that we work with or at least get more clarity on the definition like as we go into the work it's so hard to really define it because i mean we just can't define it i mean to get a consistent definition it's just kind of i feel as understandable as the concept of infinity we can explain oh it might mean this this might mean that but there's so much that we just we just can't understand and there's so much we can't put into words and I think that's just the challenge that we have you know I think there's something very interesting there you know because tying it into the afterlife research so we talk about the possibility of survival of consciousness after death, right? So we have all these things such as near-death experiences, like, you know, uh, children, people claiming to remember past lives. So we start to to think about this as, oh, you know, consciousness survives death. But these are very broad statements. Like, first of all, what is consciousness? What actually survives that? Is it your ego, your personality? Is it like, I don't know, your so what is a soul? <laughs> you know, like, is there even such a thing? And I find sometimes two people can be talking about the same thing and so much of its vocabulary. Like when I hear soul, even now I'm a little like, ugh. But when I hear like discarnate consciousness, I'm like, <laughs> okay, but it could be when we talk about the same thing. It's just the vocabulary. I'm like, Okay, discarnate, I take you seriously. Soul, I'm like, oh, that's weird. Stop. You know, not really, I'm not. But you know what I mean? It's just like, what vocabulary do you relate to? Which I think so much ties into, as we were talking about a little earlier, your upbringing. Yeah. And like, you know, I think that goes into the human aspect of of doing science. Because at the end of the day, you know, we all want the same thing. We want to get to the truth. So if you have an interest in science or in spirituality, you have some interest in getting to the, to the ultimate truth. What is this thing? What, what is reality? You know, this is sort of a hard one because one of the aspects of science 
ideally is a neutrality. And most things can be neutral. Like you study biology. So much of science is just fascinating, but emotionally neutral. This is the most emotional thing we could imagine. There just is not emotional neutrality with consciousness or survival. And I think that makes it hard. Probably the most emotional thing you could think about. Grief, our loved ones, our own mortality. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I fully agree. And I'd love to to talk a bit about neutrality in science because I think it's it's actually a very important concept when we think about all this research that is pushing the boundaries of science, you know, as, as we currently conceive of it. And well, not the mainstream science, let's say. Is there even any neutrality in science? Because even if you look at, I don't have the credentials to go into the quantum physics side of it, but let's go into parapsychology. And there are well-known effects. So let's take it at two levels. If the human in the study is not separate from the study itself, right? So you have it on the side of the participants. So you have this, this is a well-known phenomenon. So you have the classic sheep, goats types of participants. The sheep tend to believe in paranormal type phenomena. The goats are skeptical. And whenever you do, you know, in tests and in experiments that test for psi, you know, ability like telepathy, precognition, that kind of thing, sheep tend to do better. You know, the people who believe in it tend to do better than the skeptics. And it's like, well, you know, of course you could argue that, you know, you could say, well, there was maybe some methodological, you know, whatnot like going on in there. But I think there's more than that because you also look at this at the side of the experimenters and every researcher knows about the experimenter effect. Of course, you know, you can, you know, you can bias your participants with your body language and whatnot. That's why you have double blind, triple blind experiments. But there was also... This one study that was done with the exact same type of methodology, I don't remember what was the, the, um, the parapsychological phenomena they were looking at exactly, I'll have to look that up, but basically one of the researchers was on the skeptical side and one of them tended to believe in that phenomenon. Uh, and they ran the exact same study, you know, like the exact same study. And they got different results. One of them got significant results. The other one, you know, got not significant results. And then that begs the question, can we separate the experimenter from the study itself and can we separate you know it could all come down to the whole idea of consciousness being interconnected and affecting things in weird ways that for now we just think of them as randomness (laughs) you know but what is behind that randomness i think the sheep goat effect actually adds to evidence of psychs it's showing our thoughts and consciousness affect matter affect intertwine with each other affect other people's behavior But I actually have a question I do want to back up. So you read Mark's book and then you said after that, so that from my impression that really opened your curiosity next level. Were you shocked by what you read in it? Just so you guys know, Mark Goburn, his book, he writes about a lot of the evidence I talk about here and put in mind, such as scientific experiments on psychic mediums. This was the first book you read. I'm assuming this was the first time you were exposed to the scientific evidence behind Sai. Yeah, it was the first time like I, I actually I actually read the evidence uh, around Sai and I don't remember being shocked. I remember it being more like, oh, you know, because these were phenomena that I had, you know, like at least some of them I had anecdotally heard of before, like near death experiences, that kind of thing. The part that shocked me was that there was research behind it, <laughs> to tell you the truth, because no, it's like, oh, you know, near death experiences. And my thinking about that before encountering the book was, well, yeah, there's probably nothing there. Yeah, so I guess I was shocked in that sense because I used to believe there's nothing there because we would have known about it by now, right? It, it starts to sound familiar, like in the sense of the pushback that this research can get. And I was like, oh, wait, no, there, there's there's actually evidence in this sense. And that, yeah, you're right. Actually, that, that did surprise me. It surprised me that the evidence was there, but that somehow I had I had not heard of it, even with a background in psychology. And that made me think, well, then you get the lay person. So how, how are people ever going to hear about that? That's something I want to circle back to, too, about why this evidence isn't more known. But I do want to ask you, because you said after that you took a class or a workshop, was it, that really influenced you? And you did that right after reading the book. What class was that? Right. So there were a couple of things that happened afterwards. So first of all, I I started 
to explore, okay, what what's the deal with this evidence? What is, else is going on? So I started discovering like online webinars on, um, on, on topics such as, what was it at the time? Most of them were around the nature of consciousness and theories around consciousness. And jumping off from there, I ended up into this course called Expansions of Quantum Theory Towards Consciousness. And that was quite interesting. So that was a collaboration between the Dev Sanskriti University in India and the Existential Consciousness Research Institute in Germany. It was the first time they uh, they had run that course. And it was an interdisciplinary course. So it had a heavy component, like, you know, of quantum physics and implications of their findings for consciousness. And I have to tell you, Liz, as someone who, you know, wasn't too interested in physics as a student, <laughs> it was it was a pretty interesting ride. So so there was this quantum physics component, but you also had the psychology component, the philosophy component. So, you know, it, it you, people were looking at consciousness, like from all these different angles. And I remember the thing. The one of the you know main things that I could say I walked away with from there was, look, there's these people like they're they're because because I always heard you know going into spiritual circles like oh you know quantum physics this quantum physics that and to tell you the truth you know I was always very skeptical of that like I wanted to hear quantum physicists say it you know <laughs> and you know hearing them that at least seeing that they have an interest in the area of consciousness and they think there might be some links there. I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, like th there, there is something, there is something here. And actually, one of them, uh, Markus Schmicke, like who was, uh, who was coordinating the course, he actually used to be a monk. So he's a physicist, but he also, he also has this experience as a monk in an Indian monastery. And I thought it's so interesting. Like, there's all these people like blending these worlds, and you know, seeing bridges there and thinking there's something worth worth investigating there. And that was really intriguing to me. So coming back to your question, webinars, this course on uh, expansions of quantum theory towards consciousness. And after this one, I managed to get into an introduction to parapsychology course uh, organized by the, by the University of Edinburgh that I was trying actually trying to get in for like a year. They're very popular. So every, anyone listening to this, you know, sign up ahead of time. <laughs> Might take a while to grab a spot. I'm going to sign up for that. I didn't even know the University of Edinburgh did that. So just a normal, quote unquote, normal university is, is teaching this. They are big in parapsychology. You should definitely check them out. Okay, so you took all that class. At this point, was there any evidence more early on that just was the most amazing to you was there one part that you were like I've got to go further with this well I think the pivotal moment you know for my shift into science communication was uh I think it all it, it all was building up to that moment you know but I let's say like what happened right before was the introduction to parapsychology course and you know, to, to be fair, I had heard of parapsychology before very briefly, but I, I was under this impression because if you look, if you look it up on Wikipedia, you know, there's claims that it's a pseudoscience, there's nothing there, you know, all of that. And they, you know, taking this course, like even this introductory course, I was just astonished at the methodological carefulness that these researchers have, you know, and this was high quality research. And, you know, the, the claim that there's nothing there, I could see, like, you know, no, there is something here. Like, there, there are findings, there are solid findings in the direction of phenomena such as telepathy, recognition, and whatnot. Liz, let me tell you something, actually, that I was reading about today. I thought it was insane. So, you know, the discovery of the Higgs boson particle, like the God particle, you know, remember, it was a big deal, like, you know, Nobel Prize, all of that. I, I, I will have to point out here, I do not have a background in physics. So anyone with a background in physics listening to this, please forgive me for minor inaccuracies. I am absolutely doing my best to explain this. But as I understand it, there uh, basically this particle was predicted by, by theories in physics. And it was a big deal when they found it. But, you know, they, they had to be sure that this was actually the particle, right? That, 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 they, that, they, that, they, that it was the thing that they thought they found. And the, um, the chance uh, that was calculated of it being a fluke, basically, like of it not being the particle was one in 3.5 million, right? So it's pretty, you know, pretty convincing. This is it. We're accepting it as a scientific fact. That's great. 
Now, moving over to parapsychological research, the chances of some of the um, phenomena there, such as precognition, telepathy, and whatnot. So there are some studies uh, whose findings, like the, the chance of them being a fluke, are one in a billion. And they're still debated, you know? And I, I read this today in uh, in Dr. David Hamilton's book, the, um, Why Woo Woo Works. Uh, it's, it's a very catchy title. Might be off-putting to some, but I thought, that's such a good point, <laughs> you know? That's something I've learned a lot in my classes at the Rhine is just the statistical probability of so much of the data and results that these parapsychologists get it beats a lot of traditional science and then they've had traditional statisticians check it uh, do you know jessica utz oh uh, jessica jessica utz is the uh, for, a former president of the american statistical association jessica utz is also a professor of statistics in the university of california irvine right and she was president of the american statistical association she was also um, chair of the Department of Statistics in University of California, Irvine, from 2011 to 2016. She just became curious, or I don't remember if someone hired her. She became curious just to look at the results of parapsychology, some of the experiments, and she was blown away. And she, it, the results and data convinced her. And I guess one thing that I think about about this, and I want to actually ask you first, and you were saying about how, you know, all this research had been going on, but you hadn't known about it. I hadn't known about it. It took a lot of searching. Why do you think this is so unknown? Why do you think mainstream scientists are not reacting more to this? Because, you know, when you ask, for example, skeptics that, they say, oh, well, of course they're not. This is all bullshit. They're not going to take it seriously. But that's just, I have, I have a lot to say about that. But first, what do you say about that? Oh, boy. Oh, um, I think there's no simple and straightforward answer there, as, as with most things. But I think part of it is, unfortunately, coming back to dogma. And, you know, even, even at a more fundamental level, this fear of uncertainty and of change, I guess, like we have to remember that we're people, we're humans, you know, you know, scientific researchers or not, we're all human. And I I would think if I, I spend most of my life and I dedicate most of my life to, you know, exploring the world through, through a certain paradigm, a way of looking at it, then, you know, it's not, it's not that likely or that easy to, to switch over to, oh, wait, maybe this was, you know, maybe this was wrong all along. But that's, you know, the thing is, it's not even that it was wrong all along. I feel like sometimes it can be received as such, like, oh, let's just throw away the science, like, like all of this material, materialistic paradigm is useless. No, it's not useless. I like our stuff. I like this laptop and Wi-Fi and all the things that we use to, to have amazing lives. Like, um, and I like the way that the Galileo Commission report if you know of it, is uh, putting it. We, we can we can put a link uh, to that for the listeners. But basically, they're they're talking about let's just change the lens slightly. Like if we go back to the assumptions that we have when we conduct scientific research, such as you know consciousness has a material basis. You know brain generates consciousness for sure. Well, let's just dare to question to question. It comes down to questioning to questioning those assumptions a bit. And in doing so, see what else we can perceive. Maybe we can see something we didn't see before. And there's just as much mystery and as little, actually, there's less evidence uh, that the brain generates consciousness. They have no way of knowing how this material mass matter could create the depth of consciousness any more than they could understand how it could be downloaded. So both are just a form of just deciding this is a you know a fact based on belief and in fact at this point there seems to be more evidence that consciousness is downloaded by a brain but then where people get stuck which i understand is what form is that consciousness in that's downloaded there are theories that are microtubulars like microtubules microtubulars i think i'm pronouncing it right download our consciousness which sir Roger Penrose and Dr. Stuart Hameroff, two 
very well-renowned physicists seem to think. But what form is that consciousness in? And I do think there's something to saying just because we don't have any clue what that form could be or understanding the dimensions it could be in, that doesn't mean it's not true. It doesn't mean it factually is true, but to wipe out and say this is not true. I mean, there was a time we had no idea what oxygen was. We already have no idea what's trillions of miles out in outer space. We already don't understand other dimensions, such as string theory. I mean, we don't really understand them, even if we can use the word string theory. And I'm sure Dr. Lisa Randall and string theorists understand a lot more than you or I do about string theory. But Nevertheless, there's so much we used to have no idea about. There's so much we have no idea about understanding now. And that not understanding it doesn't make it untrue. I agree. There, there's a lot of unknowns. And I think this feeds back into, you know, I don't use the term dogma lightly, but when when you go to a Wikipedia page for fields such as parapsychology or people who work in these fields around nature of consciousness, you know, like uh, with the potential of life after death in whatever form and so on. And you see these labels such as pseudoscience, pseudoscientific. First of all, it's not very respectful, I believe, of, you know, people who dedicate their lives to ask these really difficult and controversial questions in the face of backlash, you know, and that we know is happening. And if, you know, Wikipedia has that function where you can go and see the history of the edits and what people talk amongst themselves as they do the edits. And there's quite a bit of conflict there, right? Because you have very, you have the very strong skeptical side. And I don't, I wouldn't even call it the skeptical side. I think in so many cases, it's pseudo skeptical because it's like, well, it's not possible because it sounds silly, basically, you know, and it's like, no, that's not scientific. You are you are doing the pseudoscience. You know, you're doing the exact same thing. You're accusing others of. Yeah, there's a lot to say there. As I said, I don't think it's a it's a very simple answer to why these things are not more well known. Oh, I just want to jump in about Wikipedia. There's actually a book. It's called Psy Wars: TED, Wikipedia, and the Battle for the Internet by Craig Weiler, W E I L E R, and it talks about how pseudo this certain group of pseudo skeptics who are a hundred percent anti-parapsychology. I mean, it's just one of the things they're dedicated to go in all day and just go in and edit and edit. I haven't read the books yet. It's on my list, so I can't fairly talk about it. Maybe after I read it, I'll do a little talk or IG live or something about it. But there, this has been a big talk about how Wikipedia responds to parapsychology without doing their due diligence. Sorry to cut you off, but I just thought that was important to address that this is a huge issue that they discussed about Wikipedia. So what I was getting at is I believe most people, you know, scientists, lay people, like whatever their background, you know, if they see the evidence, they they would be open to to entertaining these notions. It's just that the evidence doesn't doesn't make it to us all that often, you know? Or and I think part of the reason is well, for, for one, these Wikipedia words that you're mentioning, you know, that we hear the term, like, we, li- we lead busy lives, so we look it up and we see the word pseudoscience, we don't dig deeper, you know, because, you know, m- most of us have other things to do as well. You and I are a bit more obsessed, so <laughs> we dig in a little bit deeper. <laughs> yes, I, I am very yeah. obsessed, yeah. But, but you know what I mean, right? Like, the, the it, it, it does have... The stigma, and again, I think the stigma is multifaceted because if we think about uh, psi phenomena, right, I think the way most people think about it is like, well, you have the psychic, the medium and whatnot, and they're doing like some illusions, you know, and people kind of fall for it because we have all these stories of fraud, which to be fair, can and does happen. But then what I'd like to put forward is this, the thing about fraud is interesting, Because even when it happens, how can you rule out the possibility that the psychic in question is actually genuine? Let's say anyone, like this is, I'm not saying this is the case all the time. I'm just saying this is something interesting to think about. Because even if you take sports people, they're incredible at what they do, but under pressure, they can cheat. It can, it can happen. It does happen. So why would a psychic or a medium or anyone claiming these sorts of abilities be any different, especially once they start to gain popularity? 
that's oh my god i have a lot to say about that that's so true i want to back up and say one like two quick things about science that i think at least helped me because in the beginning i just people would say what you and i are saying about why science dismisses it they just haven't looked into it and i was always thinking oh no way like this is so so transformative there's no way scientists would dismiss this but after digging and digging that was one of my main questions i'm I'm baffled by this, but I've come to the same conclusion. I mean, I actually did have one example that there's a parapsychologist I know, and he said he could not give the name of the scientist, but a well-known scientist showed up at a, for lack of a better word, ghost hunt. I know it doesn't sound a sciencey enough term for, but basically investigating. And he said, under no condition, can anyone say he's there? He would lose funding and credibility, but he thinks absolutely based on physics that this is completely possible. So, but he did promise me, even though he couldn't give me the name, it was someone that was highly admirable and he's skeptical himself. And then another, there's this case I learned about at the Rhine when I took a class there. And I also have read about it quite a bit too. It's, do you know about the Gonsfeld experiments these are basically were tests done to test for psi abilities they involved putting someone into a room of sense pretty much sensory deprivation and the person in the other room would look at photos and mentally send them to the person in the Gonsfeld experiment like sensory deprivation room and they got high results But I mean, there's a lot more in depth to the study, but this isn't really about the study. Mainly it's about it was conducted by Charles Onerton. So Charles Onerton was a very serious, well-regarded, thorough parapsychologist. He worked with the Rhine, the Rhine Institute. He never did sloppy work. And then Ray Hyman was a skeptic. He was a stage magician and mentalist. And he could do, you know, all psychic stuff as a performance. And he said, all psi is fake. And no matter what, you're being tricked. And he accused Charles Onerton basically of being stupid and doing really sloppy work. So Charles Onerton saw that. And I believe from what I understand, I think Ray Hyman wrote an article about it. I don't remember exactly, but basically Charles Onerton challenged him and said, well, if you think I'm doing this all wrong, come join me. Show me what I'm doing wrong and let's try to do the study together. So they did and they came together. So what they both discovered once Ray Hyman saw what Charles Onerton had been doing, they agreed on almost everything related to the testing and they agreed on the problems with studies and they agreed that some of the studies had actually been done very well. And they did this Gonsfeld study together. And I don't think Ray Hyman ever became some major parapsychologist pro sci proponent, but he agreed that the study was done really well now. And so I think if there were a lot more scientists who would come see how this research is being done, they would change their mind. But it's just dismissed as absurd because there is a lot of absurdity. Now we can go, you know, back to the mediums, as we were saying, a lot have cheated. And you're right, some, that doesn't mean they might not have been able to do it. But there are also some who would never cheat. And what's an interesting statistic, Robert Ginsburg, Bob Ginsburg, he's one of my mentors in this world. He wrote a book called The Medium Explosion, and he's also a skeptic who lost his daughter years ago and began just in desperation examining the evidence of afterlife with his wife Fran who was recently unfortunately passed away and was like my main like heart and mentor and support system after losing my dad so that's been hard but he's come to the conclusion and I've come to this as well that 90% of the mediums can't do what they claim most are honest and think they can and then a lot of sitters the people who go to mediums tend to be believey so they're not putting high demands on them for getting evidence. But then when you put these few percent of mediums who are not only very skilled, are very ethical, would never cheat, would never lie, 
and you put them under strict controls, which Winbridge, which we definitely need to talk about Forever Family are doing, they're getting really strong evidence. Let me add a layer to that, because I think I think there's another dimension to this from parapsychology findings, you know, as as a whole, because, you know, there's been all these attempts to, to capture things in the lab, right, to capture these phenomena in the lab. And you do get effects. They're, they're super highly significant, but they're small. You know, however, in the wild, you know, you get these spontaneous experiences, right? So it seems like, you know, you try to capture it and then it kind of like fizzles out, you know, like there's there's that aspect of it. And of course, you know, the skeptical side would say, well, that's because there's nothing there. You do it once, you try to replicate it, it's gone, you know? But what if what if there's more? What if there's something about the nature of the phenomenon itself? You know, that's maybe the lab conditions are not super conducive to it, right? Um, and coming back to, to, to psychics, again, coming back to the human aspect, there's all these, all these pressures and, you know, you're human and you're trying to perform. And, you know, even if you try to solve a math task and someone is looking at you, you know, you feel self-conscious, you know, you, <laughs> you might do worse. Like th- there's that. But also, what if the their ability is there, but it might not be as predictable they, maybe they can't elicit it that predictably or maybe you know at a certain level of skill they can but you know i expect there is some variable variability there as well and then you also have that aspect of you you hear that from from mediums like you know i don't want non-believers around because you know they're <laughs> they're ruining my mojo and you know, and there's you know from a scientific stance there's something there because because, you know, it's the same as the experimenter effect. Maybe not expecting something to happen is actually interfering with the phenomenon in question. So I think there's there's nuance. I guess that's what I'm getting at. There's so many nuances there, and we try to give these black and white answers. It's a very different level of science than stuff that had been researched, like, what is the boiling point of water? I mean, this is much more subtle and varied. You know, it's not going to be repeatable the way temper boiling point of water is it's just it can't be yeah like i feel part of it might be because you know it's it, you know so psychology you know it's, it's it's humans right and we're so complex and there's just so much at play there but at the same time is it not like the rest of science could it be that we're learning something from parapsychology research when it comes to methodology that we could apply to other fields of sciences as well and maybe now what we what we file under well these were random effects this is an outlier da 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 well maybe they're not you know, if, if if we do take these more subtle ways of looking at things, we might find more interesting things um, in other areas of science as well and realize we can improve on certain ways of investigating. And uh, that's a good point. And as we learn more science, we might know how to research this better. But yeah, going back to what you were saying that mediums have different levels, I do think that. And mediums will say that everybody has some abilities to do this. Dean Radin has said that there's a, most people seem to have some form of ability, but there's a small percent that absolutely do not. And I'll have to post a link about this. There's some biological factor he's studying about this small percent that have absolutely zero abilities. And most of us have some ability and this very small percent have amazing abilities. And I Yeah, and I would guess there's some in between, and there's probably some that work as psychic mediums that have some abilities. And I've had some readings where they've gotten a couple things they could not know by chance, and they were sort of impressive things. And then they've gotten most wrong or very vague. And then, you know, I've had some that were just clearly just vague, some that believed they had abilities and you know, I don't know, you know, but they were doing things that I would call cold reading, but I would most likely say unintentionally. And, you know, I mean, there are all kinds. And then there are a few and a lot of these are, you know, the forever family ones and the Winbridge ones. And I've even found a few that were not certified by other organization that just, I mean, they were just getting 90% right. I mean, I had my identity hidden. And just the things they knew just, I mean, absolutely that was one of the instrumental things was seeing this up close myself and watching these people just defy the laws of the universe and then becoming good friends with some of them and seeing they're just the most honest 
as well as smart, normal, balanced people. Have you ever had a medium reading? I had two psychic readings in the past. One of them particularly stayed with me because it's one of those things. Like you said, she couldn't have known that, but at the same time, I think you can always make a skeptical argument uh, that, you know, there, there were ways. Let me, give, let me give you the specific example that I'm referring to. So she, she did a sort of scan on my body, right? So at one point she says, well, you, you hold grief. Was this in person reading? It was remote. And, you know, it was interesting because I did, uh, this was last year, so I, I had had two deaths in the family, right? So definitely grief is something that was there, but she couldn't have known. And now, of course, I could also see a skeptical response to that, that could say, well, you know, we're kind of exiting a pandemic, though we're not. That, but you know what I mean? You know, there was a pandemic, chances are pretty high that, you know, whoever you're reading could hold some level of grief. Now, from my personal experience, I don't favor that explanation. I just say this to show that there's, there's always multiple, multiple ways that you can interpret these experiences. That I could say the grief one. And I mean, yeah, we are... Yeah, not exiting, although we've managed to balance better the pandemic. There has been an inordinate amount of loss, but 100% of people die. So there's always going to be loss. And I think every grief is something everyone's going to deal with, whether in the middle of a pandemic or any time. I mean, you're never not going to have somebody die. But there are stuff, both in the studies I've read by Dr. Julie Beischel, to stuff that I've had where I've only given them just my first name different last name. I'm on the phone, so they're not even seeing me. I'm on a Google voice number and I'm saying nothing but yes or no. And they're getting, you know, and this is rare to have them this good, although it's not so rare to have them get at least some of this, but you know, there's a few that it was just like one after another, like, you know, I'm sensing a father energy, d giving his name. Names are rare, but it's happened describing my grandmother, knowing that like she had lost the child when it was a baby, knowing that I some stuff about my cat who'd passed away. I'll lay out and like write out exactly what they said, you know, record the reading. So I'm listening when I'm emotionless and the stuff they know is just remarkable. And I've never had a medium get a hundred percent, but if, you know, they're getting 80% or even 60% right and it's highly accurate it's just kind of like how and I mean most there have been a few that have gotten 90 and it's rare and it, yes you can come up with different explanations but that's for it but I don't think you can get into normal means for this in person you could say maybe they have some person who's reading and scanning my face and some crazy technology in another room that's doing FBI level background checks I mean Possibly. That would be very, very expensive. And one medium that was excellent that I had in person only charged like $120 and lived in a modest house. I mean, for her to have the quality that could scan my face and then do background level checks where she was getting information about my cat and my cat's personality and a loss in my family, like, I don't know, like 60 something years ago, my grandma had you know, my uncle passed when he was a baby. I mean, I, I, and she didn't even have my real name. Like, it's so highly unlikely. And could that happen once? Maybe, but could it happen repeatedly and repeatedly with people who are also passing Julie Beichel's quintuple blinded Winbridge tests? It just, the explanations come down to, and I'd be curious to know what you think about this. They just don't seem normal. It's like, okay, maybe it's survival of consciousness or maybe it's super psi. Hey, jumping in to explain super psi. So super psi, also called the super psi hypothesis. And that means that there's some like cloud memory bank that stores all information that they can tap into and not that our consciousness survives bodily death which seems to be the question, or maybe it's something we absolutely don't understand. But the more you research this, the cheating, there have been controls set up where it's just not possible. I think it's interesting how you said none of them have been 100%, because whenever I hear that, I'm like, but where, with what professional in the world do we ask for 100% consistently all the time? It's just, it's an unrealistic benchmark. And 
I think for me, you know, it's not, I mean, I was talking about my personal experiences just to place me in relation to all this research, because I think this is where scientific research is going as well. The more we start to suspect that consciousness itself may have an influence, you know, on the results, what we get to see, what we don't. Like, we will get to say, I highly suspect, look, this is me, I'm Christina, this is my training, all the formal stuff. I was raised religious, I have this bias, I am a sheep, you know, I'm a believer, you know, this is, you know, like, I might push the data that way just by virtue of that, just disclose that. And to that, I would add, well, I did have my own parapsychological experiences, right? So I had things like precognitive dreams, that kind of thing. Oh, I want to hear about a specific one. Yeah, sure. Did this happen before you started studying this or after? No, before. Four. Oh, wow. Okay, because there seems to be something with skeptical people when we start studying this. We start having weird experiences like I have. So yeah, so this happened before. So tell me your dream. So this happened before, but I do have to say after starting to investigate these things, I started getting more synchronicities and and things like that happening. So I've definitely experienced that side of things as well. Right. So this Um, It wasn't the only time uh, I had a precognitive dream, but I think this was the most impactful. So I, this was back in 2015. I was living in Belgium at the time. So I'm, I'm originally Romanian and it was Halloween night actually. So I, I go to bed and I have this weird dream. I've never had a dream like that before. Like it's basically this first person like perspective and I look down upon my body and I see my body being on fire like up to my neck, like I look at my palms, like it's it's all on fire, but I'm, I'm sort of weirdly, that, so it's not emotional, it's just like, oh, that's odd, you know, and then I wake up. And the next day, unfortunately, what I had found is that in my hometown, back in Romania, there had been a fire in a nightclub that killed a lot of people and seriously, you know, injured tens of others, like all young people, it was, it was really, really sad and you know I think I mean probably most of them you know were were about my generation you know and I didn't have any connection to the place that I knew of I knew no one there that night as far as I know you know so it was interesting that it occurred that night and then I always try to look at it from from a skeptical angle as well and I always bring the skeptical lens in because I think we need to check each other (laughs) you know you you always need to find your counterpart and check each other because we all want to get to the truth and, you know, I could say, well, it was Halloween night. So maybe like all of those, you know, associations like with bad things happening, my mind might have conjured something up and then it kind of happened that, that, you know, it was also correlated with that event. Or maybe because this was due to faulty use of pyrotechnic indoors, maybe I had seen something in the news earlier and my mind kind of, you know, worked with that. You know, you could do, you could, you could, you could come up with explanations like, these like to me in this case they're less convincing than somehow you know I picked up on that bit of info I'm not saying it's that I'm just saying as a person me Christina this is what I believe because I think it's also important to distinguish personal beliefs from this is what the science is supporting like like you were saying with God yeah I can't point to a paper like this is God but that's my personal belief and I think it's important to acknowledge it so that you know you and the listeners can see my bias there but yeah, that uh, that was one of the the more significant six months. Wow, I'm I'm so sad to hear that, and also that is, I, I mean, to me that sounds significant. But of course, you have to consider all angles. But I have a question about the dream too. Did it feel much stronger or more memorable than other dreams? Because I've noticed when I've had weird. Pro- what could be precog dreams they tend to feel i remember them better yeah like this one was odd it stood out to me just you know mainly in one respect i did never dreamt of fire before as far as i recall and again i want to do justice to the skeptical argument as well i told this story so many times like god knows what actually happened that night you know like how different or not it is from the story i'm telling now there's always that i've noticed with dreams actually talking about remembering when I've started writing them down I've started remembering them more and more and the more I write them down the I remember them much more in depth and what I started to notice is I do have a lot of precognitive dreams which I can share a story about that too but there's also a book a 
fairly skeptical man from about 100 years ago in the 1920s, J.W. Dunn wrote an experiment with time. And he started to notice he'd like had some dream that came true. And he started to write down all his dreams and he noticed them constantly coming true. And very often it's very insignificant stuff that comes true. Like, I mean, I just dream dumb things. Like I haven't dreamt of anything like there's going to be a plane crash here and then I get to save lives or here's a lottery numbers and I get to become rich. Like I dreamt once that my gym class and it was, I'll give two kind of precognitive dreams I've had and they were, they were just meaningless, um, but interesting. They weren't meaningless in the sense they were very profound and that they show time and space and consciousness operate differently, but they were not changing the world. And I wouldn't have even remembered them if I hadn't been in a stage of my life where I was writing down dreams. Once like I take a bar method class in LA and I had a dream and it, wasn't exactly by my, my bar method class, but it was like they have this little outdoor area with like picnic tables. And I dreamt something very similar to that, although I didn't necessarily make the association it was bar method, but it looked it was like a courtyard that looked similar. And I went in and was sitting at this picnic bench and there were four choices of juices. And the next day they had samples of a brand at my bar method class offering four types of juice. I'm like, okay, that's so cool. I mean, it's completely meaningless. I can't do anything with it. <laughs> but and so I'm like, well, maybe we're constantly dreaming these old things. They're just not that important. You know, they're not like we think of precognition as this like massive life thing, but we might just be having all these little ways that time waves are being processed differently. And we might be taking these decisions constantly in our lives in ways we don't know. We don't know why we make every single decision. Like you'll walk into a store and you run into your ex mm. and maybe you're debating between going one of two ways and you avoid running into someone you don't want to see and you have no idea. And the other dream I had was very location based. It was just like, I get some body work done in LA. And the night before I had one of my sessions, like a rolfing session, I just had a very specific dream that I was walking in to go to my appointment, but the place looked really different than her actual place. But it was very specific and I wouldn't have remembered it if I hadn't been writing down my dreams. It was just really meaningless. Like I go to walk in and I walk into this room and she's like, oh, I'm running 20 minutes late. Can you wait over there? I was like, sure. And then I go into a room and like a little boy is just on the computer in the room. And it was just such a meaningless dream. But I'm like, okay, I'm studying all this. Let me just tell her the dream and see if it's anything. And she's like, what the fuck? That matched her brother's country house like to a T. Oh. I drew a map and it was, and then I described the boy. And she's like, that's his son. And I was like, what the fuck? And I'm like, we probably just, I mean, it was so meaningless. It was like, who would think? even to note a dream like that. So I think there might be lots of that that we have all the time. I suspect so too, because I I, I got some of those as well, you know, com completely meaningless, you know, for, for most intensive purposes. And, and I, I, I heard anecdotes of that, you know, just, yeah, random stuff, like the movie that was playing on the plane that they took the next day, things like that, like not very consequential. Yeah, yeah I think it's cool. I think it's interesting why... You know, because, you know, with, with big events, like the one I was telling you about, you know, I could see some sort of evolutionary advantage, like, well, you know, if we can, you know, if you can sense something dangerous is coming, then, you know, you can, you can take action to avoid that and, you know, survive. But if, if it's something like this, that's not immediately relevant or consequential, then it's interesting. Why, why would we even pick up on them? And it's interesting that you say if it's evolutionary beneficial, like, I think this is an issue a lot of science people will say is you know, they dismiss a lot of this and they're like, oh, it's anti-science. And I mean, I think it goes into, I mean, I could talk for hours about just this one topic, but part of it, you know, at least in America, I'm sure other places that's been like a classical debate, like, you know, some religious people, definitely not all say evolution is bullshit. And that's just very, in my mind, not, it's not, it's not good. Like, I mean, there's a lot more attached to that stuff politically. And a lot of times that mindset is grouped in with parapsychology and all of this, but they're not mutually exclusive. Why could consciousness not, not be non-local, not be somewhere else besides here, not created by a brain, be downloaded by a brain. And still we're working to constantly 
improve the material experience based on what works and what's not. And that's evolution. Like you don't, none of this says that all the scientific stuff we've studied isn't true. I mean, that still completely ties into evolution. And it's just, I guess that's a bit of like Robert Lon- Dr. Robert Lanza's biocentrism, which is consciousness created the universe. And if we're using some form of consciousness that uses form of trial and error and intelligence, just like the way we make everything else in our lives, you know, from a startup to like baking a cake, you know, there's always a bit of improvement and trial and error, both ourselves as well as like in history of what we're, you know, our ancestors, what we're building on. Why could we not have done that with creating humans and improving humans and dogs and horses and evolution? I mean, that would be evolution. And I, I don't think it requires that there isn't a form of consciousness. And Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think, you know, like kind of conflating consciousness, you know, the, the idea of consciousness being non-local with, well evolutionary theory there's nothing to it then you know it's kind of throwing the baby away with the bad water you know like it's i agree like why 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 wouldn't they coexist and it it also reminds me of of other like counter because it, it is counterintuitive let's say to think of consciousness as non-local right we at least you know it, it, we, it's not how we think about it usually but you know, I I can definitely um, see how it can tie in. Like we were talking, like you know, with well, you know, you can have like an evolutionary advantage, kind of like getting this information via these uh, non-local means. And it also reminds me of of Rupert Sheldrake's work. You know, the the whole sense of being stared at. I think all of us have had this experience. No, we just mind our business, and we have this impression that we're being stared at. You know, and we turn around and lo and behold, someone's looking at us, you know, and uh, it's a it's a very eerie experience almost like I don't even know how to explain it. Right. You need to kind of feel it to understand that. But yeah, Rupert Sheldrake has done has done some work on that. And he um, he was mentioning how it could prove to be it could, it could be like some sort of evolutionary adaptation. Right. Because if I am a deer and I'm in the forest and I'm going about my business and I feel someone staring at me, I don't know, a predator, you know, it would be very beneficial because, you know, I could just run off and, uh, and survive, you know, and it's, it, it's not something that's very intuitive, right? Because we have this idea and this is where like it, it gets, you know, like controversial, right? Because it's a non-intuitive type of thing because he talks about, well, we have we have the sense of seeing, so like, you know, it goes one way, like kind of like environment, you know, coming in. But he's also like, could we also maybe project in some way, shape or form? To, 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 be, to be honest with you, I would have to go deeper into his work to be able to properly explain that. But I thought it was interesting in terms of a non-intuitive way of looking at senses that we think we already understand. I love his work. And am I right? He's the one who did a TED Talk that was banned. Yes. If you guys Google banned TED Talk, Rupert Sheldrake, you'll find it. It's a re- he talks about this. He talks about animals that sense when their owners, dogs specifically, are going to come home. That's a really great experiment. And he obviously did all the obvious controls. Like the owners had to be really, really far away, not coming home at consistent times. And they still would sense even when their owner was like miles away that they were coming home. Speaking of Rupert Sheldrake, actually, there's this course that I'm actually really excited to attend. It's called the Rupert Sheldrake course. It's organized by uh, Advaya, so A-D-V-A-Y-A. Like if you look them up on Instagram, you should see the posts about the course and all that. Um, And um, as I understand it, he's expanding on his ideas uh, from his book, The Science Delusion, you know, where he focuses about, you know, all these assumptions, right, that we have, like, at the basis of science, and it's kind of like questioning that very foundation, because, you know, as, as I said, nothing is above questioning, and, you know, like, the, the way he puts it was, well, well, science included. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited. I'm really looking forward to that course. Some of the listeners might want to tag along. I might want to tag along. Yeah, he's a really interesting guy, and I, I also find the fact that they banned him and TED Talk like it just shows how much bias there is against 
just exploring this information because he's not like a woo guy. He's not saying anything that could harm anyone with this. I mean, I understand some pseudoscience can be harmful when it comes to stuff about medicine. And there's always the ethical balance of free speech versus protecting people. And it's not always black and white, but none of this is harmful. It's just curious. And I think it's unfortunate there's such kind of a conflation with some pseudoscience that really has been harmful versus just pure curiosity about the nature of consciousness. And that seems to be part of human nature when you go back to the times of Galileo. There's a lot of suspicion about a certain level of curiosity. And I think that's been something that's I don't know. I've, I, I'm kind of putting together my thoughts about that, but that seems to be something in human nature where there's a type of person who's very frightened of curiosity and they're often in charge of a lot of things too, oddly. I, I, I don't know enough of what I'm talking about about this because it's kind of been a new thoughts I've been toying with. That's interesting. I, I, I would see it as norms and the need to belong, you know, and I, I think that's toying with our rationality quite a bit and with what we dare to question and what not, right? Because the moment we ask a question that might be perceived as too out there or too inconvenient, you always run the risk of being ostracized, not being part of the group anymore. And I think it does come down a lot to group identity because we were speaking of, well, why are these topics? Why is parapsychology, near-death experiences, past life stories, all these things, you know, why are they... Why is it not more widely known that their topic being taken seriously in scientific research and that there's actually, you know, solid evidence there? And I think we have this conceptualization of science, right, and how we've done science so far. And actually, I'd love to tie it in a little bit to my business name here as well, because I operate under the business name of Wordful Woman. Now, Liz, to tell you the truth, this name has been with me since like my previous business. Like I, I have been working with this name, doing different work. But you know, when I pivoted, there was something, there was this intuitive knowing, like, don't change it. It's not it's not making sense now, but it will kind of thing. So I was like, okay. And I think that its, its meaning is still evolving, but what it came to mean for me right now, as I'm reading more about science, the history of science, why don't we, you know, like integrate these, these findings easier, like into our culture, is that, you know, science is not outside of human foolery, as I say, right? Like, it's it does have a history that is very biased, right? Like, you know, think about the times when, you know, it was only men that could do science, you know? So, you know, it, you, you didn't get any people of any other gender in there. And, you know, there's, there's this Western bias, right? There's this well-known phenomenon that a lot of studies have weird participants, weird meaning Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and from democratic societies. And, you know, even as a psychology student, you know, taking part in studies, like looking back on that, because a lot of studies, you know, (laughs) they are done on psychology students, you know, we need to get experience on as a participant to to become researchers as well. And we're a handy population there to take part in the studies. And looking back, I keep thinking, you know, me, Christina, a white woman who's, you know, living in Europe and only been living in Europe. What is, what does my experience at like 20 have to do with ex- an experience of, I don't know, a Siberian shaman, you know, or, you know, take, take all, all the people around the globe, all the wonderful diversity we have. I feel that we are over generalizing. So just coming back to this whole idea of why we we're not as keen to accept things that might sound weird. It's because I think we have this still, we're still stuck maybe in this narrow concept of what it might mean to do science, right? And this, well, science is necessarily, as you were pointing out, Liz, earlier as well, well, there's objectivity, there's this idea, and we always associate the science with objectivity. But why? Because actually, if if you look at, at feminist science, you know, there's this push for more subjectivity. And, you know, what is then the role of subjectivity in science? And You know, I think it's all about looking back and questioning how we even conceptualize about this lens, about the scientific lens and what it allows us to see and not. So just to wrap it all up, I think the way we conceptualize of it now is not fully compatible with these new findings of non-local consciousness and all these counterintuitive interpretations that are emerging. And I feel we need to reconcile that there. What do you think of that? The things that come to me off the top of my head are, first of all, when you put it that way, and I think about things, science has just as much history of sexism as religion. And it's something that there's been so much anger at religion about because it's not only people will say it's fantasy based and there are problems religion causes, 
from murdering people in history to dividing people now to passing laws against marriage and women's bodies. At the same time, history of science, that it has a lot of just as dark history. The core of both are pure when you look at it. Like one really, both are really trying to find truths. And it's easy for me to say from my bias that religion, I think, has caused a lot more harm than science. But at the purest forms of both and the worst forms of both, they've both caused a lot of harm and they both have a lot of biases. Look at the Tuskegee experiments done. That might just be more, I don't know if you know about it, it's very American history, but done on black men. If you don't know, the Tuskegee experiment is this awful thing that we really should have been taught in school. I'll link to it in the show notes so you can learn more. But in short, in 1932, there was no treatment for syphilis. Researchers recruited 600 black men for them to study the disease. They were mainly sharecroppers, and they never visited a doctor. Once penicillin was discovered as a known treatment for syphilis, the treatment was withheld so they could continue to study the full progression of syphilis. So many of those men suffered needlessly. Some went blind. Many died. So yeah, super fucked up. And there's been a whole a lot of focus on science. It's true, and I'm taking now the science of medicine, where it really seems to focus on the health of white men. And that's very that's very sexist. And you know, kind of the more secular mindset is we always think of religion as so sexist, but science is always perfect. And it's true. I mean, that just shows how it's always had its biases, which is something I think. I turn my back on, but from, you know, women scientists, very often they talk about just horrible sexism they're constantly fighting in the field. Okay, I'm interrupting here to be clear. I don't want to make a false equivalency. Religion is currently abused much more than science. Look at the recent overturning of Roe in the USA, for example or the murder of Masha Amini in Iran by the morality police for not properly wearing a hijab. I'm just saying that I'd never really thought before about the sexism or abuse of science. And while I think it happens much less currently than the abuse of religion, it still definitely happens, and it definitely has its biases. And you also brought up, like, focusing on the Western. That's actually... Western white. I mean, that's interesting, too, because I remember one of the early things that really helped allow my mind to open mindedly explore afterlife evidence when, you know, I'd start to explore it. I'd be like, I'm lying to myself. And I was doing a lot of shutting myself down. But very early, I went to a talk and I write some about this talk in my book. But, you know, it was primarily most of the people actually think everyone who was speaking there was white some men, some women. And it was actually my mom's a therapist and a psychoanalyst. In my book, I make her a psychiatrist because she kind of, she wanted me to respect some privacy about her identity because she still thinks all this is really weird. Um, Sorry, mom. Um, But her psychoanalytic institute, also they do work with neuroscientists and psychiatrists quite a bit too, but they had a talk and they were having, I kind of like begged her to allow this woman to organize this talk because it was about a lot of the psi research, which she was so against. There's just one woman in the Institute who was like, always wanted to do this. And my mom was sort of in charge of the scheduling. And she was like, fine, okay, for my daughter in her early grief, I'll let this woman organize these speakers. And it was a wonderful talk and people actually went, but one of the people, and again, was in New York, all Western and white. And this man, who was a therapist, was talking about how he'd done a lot of work in India. And he was a lot of patients in India and he was, I guess he maybe had lived there for 10 years. And he talked about this one young woman's grandmother had recently passed away. And he described her as like a businesswoman, you know, young, but getting on a successful track and smart and in one of the big cities, you know, so very cosmopolitan just, and she was talking about getting signs from her grandmother who passed away. And he was like, that's just considered normal there. And it, something hit me. I was like, India is huge. 
and filled with people. And why would I think we're any smarter than they are just because we happen to live here? That's ridiculous. So that I was like to completely dismiss when all these other cultures think this stuff is real to completely dismiss this without consideration that is so arrogant and that was just a thought I had that helped me open my mind to say to allow myself to start processing some of this information I think anyone who has been at the end of you know being ignored not having their ideas taken seriously being discriminated in any way shape or form can understand that you know and I I think this is such a valuable perspective to bring, you know, and, and I guess where I was trying to get at is that, you know, with the whole thing about group identity and the norms, like, yeah, I agree. I mean, both, both religion, I mean, and, and I don't think spirituality is an exception to that as in science, you know, they have their, their, their dark parts and their history and, you know, even, even at present, but I think because we can't take them outside of the social context. And, you know, science has been, and religion, but let's focus on science, like science has been shaped in a certain way that we, we, it determines what things we take seriously and which ones we don't. And then, you know, if you want to keep being a scientist with, as you said, with very real implications, you know, to get funding, to be taken seriously, to have a career, you know, you need to, you know, you, you need to stick to the group norms. It has very real implications. It's not just the choice you make. And also, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stories about scientists, like you said, who do engage, who do have curiosity about these topics, who might want to engage in this work, but but they can't, you know, because for some, it might be career suicide for, you know, there might not be funding. Money makes the world go round. Like it's, it's a very valid concern. So there's all these social human barriers that we need to kind of, disentangle and you know make sense of so we can popularize this research i think you're right and i think it's just been shocking because again people would say that oh scientists have all these reasons why they can't pursue it and i never believed it but now it's been like left and right every day another story scientists being banned from giving talks losing funding and yeah social ostracization i mean i'm not a scientist and i still I mean, I'm about to publish a book and a brand around this topic. I still get super uncomfortable being open about it. You know, I usually lead with like the fact I'm doing startups and looking into launching another startup. And when I go on dates, for example, I do not bring this up early. You know, I mean, I'm, I sort of talk around it that I write some about science and spirituality. So I can imagine people embedded in their whole career at next level. I consider myself a curious person, but I'm still... I'm not immune to the worrying about the social stigmas of this topic. So I think there's something there. Well done to you, you know, for, for doing it in spite of social stigma. Like it's important. It's really important work, you know, and, and it's not always easy, you know, like keeping this, this, this stigma in mind, but, oh, oh boy. Another, another thing just dropped in, like about this, this idea of how we shaped science. You know, when you look at, at research, on parapsychological phenomena so you know telepathy and all that there is a pattern right and like people who are artistic creative like or you know uh, however that is measured you know like tending to to get more significant results and it makes you wonder i mean researchers are very creative like for sure so it's it's not that but it does make you wonder like is there maybe a a split or something in terms of like personalities like you know how how did we shape science what kind of traits did we reward which traits did we not reward and does that in of an effect what we're able to see so in no way am i implying researchers are not creative they're super creative they need to be creative but you i think you get you get what i'm getting at like is there something in the in what we've selected for in academia as well that 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 might shape what we're what we see and what we're willing to see in you know business as usual type of thing Oh, Floyd Arbach, he taught me something so interesting in one of his classes. And I actually also discussed this a little in my book, (laughs) but just about how much we like our society and what we're taught interprets what we perceive. And he talked about research being done. He'd learned in, I believe, in grad school about a pygmy tribe and they lived amongst trees and a very heavy forestation area. So they never really saw far in the distance. And then they were taken 
I don't remember why, but they're like a re- someone took them on a hike. Like a researcher was staying with them for a while and took them on a hike, and they went out into an open field and saw buffalo way in the distance. And you know, as they were getting closer, the buffalo are perceived as bigger, and they didn't understand depth perception. Their brain had not developed it. They thought they were bugs. And they couldn't understand why the bugs were getting larger. That just makes you rethink so much. And there's so many ways to think about that. Is is it brain neurons that develop that perceive depth perception? Is it what we're culturally taught? But depth perception was not part of their life because of the heavy forestation. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, so this it all comes back to to diversity, right? And the diversity of how we even perceive the world. And, you know, we want to make sure that we, 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 we look at everyone's experience and we incorporate everyone's experience, right? Also on, on the scientist side, right? Uh, I, I, always think, I always think like, you know, we all have a piece of the puzzle, but we really need to bring them together. I see what you mean about how when we, all the pieces come together, because I have come to think when I put all the evidence together, combined with all the research, my own experiences, just everything... All of it is so strong when it comes together that I'm almost convinced there is an afterlife. I think there's a possibility. It's something we don't know yet. And it's also a possibility it's super psi, which means that there's like this huge consciousness bank that we all have access to. But if that's the case, that would mean why would our consciousness not survive in some way? And then there's a tiny, I can never eliminate the possibility we're completely wrong and it's materialism and I'm not processing it right. I think at this point it's possible, but to me it's become the least likely explanation. And I think this comes down to just the vast body of evidence in all areas from mediumship to afterlife. And what I find interesting is that most skeptics who've come to this conclusion, who've heavily researched Dr. Jeffrey Mishloff, who just won the Bigelow Prize all their conclusions end up being the same as well as just people I've spoken to, that it's this huge body of evidence when it comes together. And I just find it interesting that all of us have kind of come to it, same conclusions, same reasons overall. And I'm curious, what do you think? Is, is there an afterlife? Is there super psi? Is it, what, how, what do you think at this point? Oh boy. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to non-local consciousness, I'm pretty convinced, you know, because, you know, if, if I accept the rest of psychology research, then I need to accept non-local consciousness, right? Otherwise, you know, I, I would find myself needing to question everything all over again, right? The standard of evidence that we normally take to accept something as a scientific fact has been exceeded, super exceeded. So non-local consciousness, I am pretty convinced by now. That that being said, never exclude the possibility that I'm going to change my mind. So I, I always keep that in the rear view. As to afterlife, um, again, I think it comes down to, to to a lot of labels that we use. I think we, we don't necessarily agree on what an afterlife might even look like. As I said, it's a, it's, is it survival of our ego? Is it survival of, is it this like huge consciousness that we kind of tap in and, you know, it, that is the thing that remains. But I think there is something there. So I don't believe... In the materialistic sense, well, we die, the brain-generated consciousness, brain's dead, that's that, you're gone. So I'm not in in that camp. I don't think the evidence supports that. I think the evidence is way more supportive of something being beyond that. And to me, what's interesting is that if you look at experiences, some of the experiences, near-death experiences, and also at psychedelic research, when people say, I've seen this reality that was more real than our reality, the colors were more vivid, you know, and upon coming back from near-death experiences, some people basically being, feeling that they're limited, that they're constrained, that it's almost as if you go from a 3D reality to like a 2D reality, you know, I used to understand so much, and now it's just like... I think someone actually said, you know, oh, I just have a human brain as if that's a limiting factor. Right. And, you know, we can talk about that for three more hours because, of course, the brain filters and all that, like we don't perceive everything all the time. So, yes, I believe based on the evidence, there is some sort of afterlife. It might be even richer than what we experience now in some ways, but I think we just can't fully conceptualize of it until we're actually there or we get like a little peek through uh, through these experiences. And I guess we can all 
seemingly get little peaks from like medium readings, trying to do out of body experiences, near death experiences seem to get it the most. I also find interesting too is I will just take reincarnation. That is not incompatible with materialism. So I find it interesting how materialism dismisses all of it because if our brain creates consciousness and I get to experience being me, why could another material body not create another me, not Liz, not the same person, but just getting to experience where I get to be a me. Why could that not happen again as a totally different person? And that was one of the things that opened me to. But the first thing is I don't think, for example, reincarnation is incompatible with materialism. And then, you know, it can go further into that. But I've just, just I guess when we say we don't know what an afterlife is. There's just a lot of ways to look at it and all different things. I mean, we truly don't know. I agree that the evidence I think is very in favor of it. And I don't even like the word afterlife. And I know my mentor Fran would say that too, in that it implies this life and then another dimension and that's it. And to me, that's more like, I mean, I do use the word afterlife. It's kind of the word we adopt because it makes sense in our time-based linear experience here. But if there are all these different states of consciousness, we most likely infinitely experience or I don't know if most likely, but evidence to me, this seems to be what at this point, the evidence I have, what I'm thinking now. So we have all these different states of consciousness, some material, some not, some in earth, some are probably other planets, some probably other galaxies. And we just sort of pulsate into all these different consciousness experiences, probably eternally, whatever eternally means. That would be my guess. That would be cool. <laughs> I mean, it's come to make the most sense to me, you know, believe it or not, and based on evidence and logic, not yeah. fantasy. So that's kind of where I'm at. That is awesome. And, you know, I think that's a beautiful way to, to kind of bring our conversation together, right? Because, you know, you look at evidence, you build some mental models, and, you know, we're always open to the idea of changing our minds. But, you know, we're, we're working with something in the meantime. So if there is one thing someone just starting this in grief, skeptical, what would you say is like the initial most compelling bit of evidence that someone could get started with that would make them hope enough to keep going? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I'm actually not super keen on approaching it that way, because to me, it's not one bit of evidence that really says, oh, wow, you know, non-local consciousness is a thing, afterlife is a thing. I think to me, it's all this evidence from different fields coming together. So we have the parapsychology research, we have the near-death experiences, we have the past life claims, we have the psychedelic research, you know, altered states of consciousness, everything coming together, I think is the most convincing. So, you know, I think, you know, depends also how you define a skeptic, because, you know, if, if we have someone who, who approaches it in a pseudo-skeptical manner, I don't think there's much point pushing there, because, you know, that person just won't be receptive to any evidence at that point. But if it's someone who is curious about these topics, I think one of the best things to set you on this journey is direct experience. So you have something weird happen to you that you just can't explain, and that makes you curious to dig in deeper. I really think that's probably the most convincing way for someone who's kind of, you know, on the edge. <laughs> Which happened to me. You shared a really cool experience with dreams happening to you. Is there any final thing you want to share? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, Liz, thank you so much for having me on. It was lovely to connect with you. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, what I would what I would love to close it on is just a reminder of n nothing is above questioning. Don't be afraid to ask questions and don't be afraid to change your mind. We are not our ideas. As I said, you know, I, I've switched my beliefs based on the evidence that I've seen. And I think, you know, getting overly attached to our ideas can be harmful. So I think it's good, you know, to, to keep them a little bit separate from our identity and just, you know, we entertain them, we hold them for a bit, but we are not them and we can change our minds at any time. So let's just follow the evidence and yeah, have fun. Thank you so much. And just be sure to let everyone know, where can they find you? Yeah, so I'm Wordful Woman on all platforms. So um, I am mainly active on Instagram. 
under Wordful Woman. You can also find me on LinkedIn. So if you go to the um, uh, to the link in my bio, you can find my LinkedIn there. Uh, if not, it's LinkedIn dash I N dash Wordful Woman, or otherwise just look up my name, Christina A Moraru, and you know I I should pop up. <laughs> information on what the fuck just happened to pre-order my book wtf just happened a sciencey skeptic explores grief healing and evidence of an afterlife where i share all about the early stages of my grief how i came to conclude there most likely is an afterlife and the amazing fascinating people i met along the way and read about how much I harassed them trying to get evidence, see if they were cheating, go to wtfjusthappened.net. Check us out and subscribe to our newsletter. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. It makes such a difference, especially for a new podcast like this one. And if you've had any crazy what the fucks yourself, have any questions, feedback, or just want to say hi, reach out on either Instagram at WTF underscore just underscore happened underscore or email me at hello at WTF just happened dot net. And remember, you don't have to draw any final conclusions as you wonder what the fuck just happened. <laughs>